So can you go with me for a quick word of prayer? And then God will clear my mind and we can go right into this word. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you today for how you have brought us to this place, even through this turmoil, how you have been good enough to allow your children, your saints, to stand up, rise up, and take our rightful place and responsibility. Lord, as we come this morning praying to you, get your glory out of this situation. We're ready. You told us to be prepared for anything that comes down because you have our back. And we're ready, God. We're ready to stand up. We're ready to continue to pray. We're ready to continue to uh, intercede. We're ready to, ready to stand in the gap to make sure that the world sees the light of the gospel as their only hope. Thank you, God. Let's go to this word. Let's go. Go with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Thank you, musicians. Thank you, praise team. First Thessalonians chapter 5. I don't know if you knew this or not, but the book of Thessalonians um, is considered to be the first letter that Apostle Paul wrote. Some historians even believe that it supersedes or it was written even before the Gospels. So that means that this was the first word God gave after the silent period in the Bible that kind of bridges the Testament, the Old Testament into with Malachi, and then God spoke. I know Luke is in our canon, but they believe that this book of Thessalonians was the first book that was written, the first letter that was written. Let's read. We're going to chapter 5 of First Thessalonians. And I'm going to read from verse 12 down to verse 23. So I want you to go with me from 12 to 23. So uh, 11 verses of Scripture this morning. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but every man follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the Spirit. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, that your whole spirit, soul, and body be blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I need you to go with me on this title for as long as the Spirit of the Lord will allow. We're going to speak from the thought, little things bring big results. One more time. Little things, big results. Results. The Apostle Paul founded this church at Thessalonica on his second missionary journey. Now, if you're a Bible scholar, you know in Acts chapter 16, Paul had just been freed miraculously from prison and then left Philippi after getting out of prison, and then in Acts 17, he went over to Greece, and him and Silas and Timothy ended up in this small city called Thessalonica. When they got to Thessalonica, Paul began to preach. Paul preached such a powerful word that people got saved all over the place. I mean, there were folk coming to Christ in droves. Well, the Judaizers, those who were still following the law, 
got upset about this. They said, why uh, are they coming here preaching this gospel and all of these people falling behind them? See, what they were upset about is when the gospel is preached, people get free. When the gospel is preached, people have power. And they saw people, ordinary people, who were changed and touched by the gospel. And you know what happens? Those Judaizers got angry. Those were the Jews who wanted you to still live by the law. You know the people that think you're not saved unless you act like they act? And so then they got so angry that persecution broke out. But not only from the Judaizers, but from the Romans also. Because these new Christians, these new converts, were saying, King Jesus. Ah, and the Romans didn't like that. They said, how are you saying there's another king besides Caesar? And all of a sudden, they ran Paul and Silas and Timothy out of Thessalonica. Matter of fact, they had to run for their lives. And they got to Berea, the next town over. When they got in Berea, the Spirit of God was still hot. They got saved again. People started getting saved all over the place. People started getting converted. The Spirit of God was moving on this missionary journey. And they got saved. And guess what happened? Those same, you know, you're not going to believe this. Those same people, that same mob that ran them out of Thessalonica came to Berea when they heard that people were getting saved. And they ran them out of Berea. When I read that, I started thinking, isn't this something that there's always people that want you to tone down your excitement, to tone down who you are in God. They don't understand how you can be going through and still be trusting God. They, they get mad because they see your life going through stuff, and they still see you lifting your hands and thanking God. They see and they know about the trouble you've been in, and they wonder how are they still holding on? Why are they still reading their word? They don't understand because they have not seen or know or heard. They couldn't have served the same God that I've been serving. Their life, are miserable. Their life is miserable, and they want your life miserable. I can't figure it out how people want you to stop being happy because you're finding out that you're just not a hearer of the Word, but you're a doer of the Word. They get mad because they're reading the Word, but you're standing up doing the Word. And the only reason they don't realize you're doing the Word is because that Word is your style. But that's what they did. This same mob of people, they're all over the place, everybody church, they want you to stop being so happy about God. Well, then he went to Athens. And when he went to Athens, because of all the intellectualizing there by the philosophers, he didn't have many converts. So when Paul got to Corinth, which was his next stop on his journey, it says scripturally that Paul found himself a little depressed and out of sorts. So as Paul was resting up to carry on the gospel, the Bible says he thought to himself, wonder how that little church in Thessalonica is doing. He said, I was only able to stay there three and a half weeks because they ran me out less than a month. And they were under all kind of persecution. Paul was so upset. Wonder what's going on with that church. And all of a sudden he said, I know what I got to do. He said, I'm going to send Timothy back. And let Timothy check on this church so I can find ways to encourage them and lift them up. You will not believe to Paul's surprise. Not only was the church at Thessalonica surviving, the church at Thessalonica was living victorious among the persecution. They had saints in Thessalonica that were living like they had been saved a long time, like seasoned saints. They were praying every day. They were struggling through the persecution. They were still representing the name of Jesus. Paul was amazed at what they were doing. And so this, this excitement when Paul brought back, when Timothy brought back the letter, the excitement to Paul, Paul wrote this book of 1 Thessalonians, which is the first of two letters he walked. To, he wrote to this church that was endeared to his heart by the way they acted. Even though they were going through struggle, he wrote this letter to them for three reasons after hearing the report from Timothy. Write this down. First thing they did, he wrote this letter to them to let them know how their report had lifted his spirits. 
he was so happy to hear they were doing okay. Now, I want you to see this because that's a shout for somebody so you don't miss it. When you find out, I don't know about you, but isn't it exciting when you find out that God has been blessing someone who's going through the same struggle you're going through? Isn't there something when you find out that there's some people who survive cancer, who survive uh, financial dis- disarray, who survive health situations, who survive their children going through problems? How many of you know that it's exciting when you hear their testimony because it does something to you? Because it brings us to one of the most, uh, uh, one of the scriptures that's sometimes neglected, but brings us into a place where God can take us to another higher level of blessing. What am I talking about? Romans chapter 2, verse 11, says something that I said would make you shout. It says, God is no respecter of person. Wow. What it's saying is, that you don't ever have to worry when you see somebody else getting blessed, because if God blessed them, he can bless you. If God healed them, he can heal you. What you ought to be doing is get excited about the fact that God is not respecting them any more than he is you. If you grab a hold to that promise, if you grab a hold to that word today, oh, I'm helping somebody right now. If you read that word and make it ring to you and say, this is my blessing now, and I know he can do it because I saw him bless somebody else, that's how God brings us back to a place of deliverance. I'm not going to sit in church and see you getting blessed with stuff I need and see Sit there whining and complaining. No, I'm going to go out and grab my blessing. Somebody say, grab your blessing. God said, I'm no respecter of person. So here's what I know. If they can prosper, I can prosper. If they can get blessed, I can get blessed. If they can make a comeback, I can make a comeback. If they can get a fresh start, I can get a fresh start. All I'm telling you is, Paul said, I am so happy. He wrote them, first of all, to tell them how excited he was. That they refreshed his spirit because of what he was going through. The second reason he wrote this letter is to tell them that he had started writing, he had started talking about some doctrine. And because he could only spend three and a half weeks there, he had to leave before the teaching was completed. And when Paul had an opportunity, he knew that, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, he started teaching them about the day of the Lord or the second coming of Christ. Uh, and First Thessalonians and Second Thessalonians, because of this letter and the second letter, have some of the most meaningful, some of the most familiar understanding of the day of the Lord and what's going to happen when Christ comes back. As a matter of fact, Paul took the language or the symbolism of when a Roman Caesar gets ready to come and the people go out to meet him. Paul told them, you don't have to worry. Jesus is going to come back and we're going to meet him in the air. Oh, my God. And when I meet him in it, Paul said, you don't have to worry about what's going on in the day of the Lord. Because there were Judaizers and false teachers trying to get them upset about what's going to happen when you die. Trying to take them away from the teaching Paul taught them. And what he said is, don't worry about that. And they, they were worried about what's going to happen to all my relatives that didn't have a chance. He said, wait a minute. Those who died in the Lord, you ain't got to worry about the dead in Christ. They shall rise first. Then we, which are alive, shall be caught up. To meet him in the air. That's why First and Second Thessalonians talk to us about God keeping us away from the day of wrath, and it's considered to be part of end time teaching in the doctrinal sense. And then the third reason takes us to our text. Please listen, because I'm getting ready to skip and show you something in this text that will mess you up. Third reason he wrote to them was he said, "I'm amazed you still made it." But I know why. I need you to stay faithful to the little things you've been doing because those little things I've seen other churches not do and you're surviving because you're doing what we consider to be the little things, but it's the little things that bring big results. What I'm saying is, he said, keep praying on a daily basis. Keep reading and studying the Word of God every day. Keep repenting when you do something wrong. Keep serving other people with the gospel. Keep being a good steward. Keep being obedient to the Word. Be consistent in your efforts to worship God. Worship every day. See, here's what I want to tell you. Here's the power in this book of Thessalonians. They were doing the little things that ended up with them having big power, able to overcome 
some stuff because most of us, most of the church of God, we done got stuck on the big things. We got stuck on the silly things. We got stuck on doing big things, but we're not consistent and don't do the little things that uphold us and bring us to a place of power. Come on, I know I'm talking right now. Some of us got to realize we like the big stuff. What am I talking about? We like public shouting. We'll get in public. Not so much now because of the pandemic, but we got in public and we would shout all over. And that was part of our ritual of serving God. And because we would get a big shout in front of everyone else, everybody thought we were saved and okay. We like the big stuff. We like calling on God's name when we're in trouble. Oh, can't beat us calling on the Lord's name when something go wrong. Oh, Lord, my God, I need you. Oh, Lord, we'll call him day and night because we like that big stuff. That's what salvation is supposed to be about, those big moments. You know what I'm talking about? We like learning the latest Christian language and the rhetoric of being saved. What am I talking about? We like walking around saying, God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. We say anything that does not penetrate or keep us on our walk. We're more concerned about cliches than we are concerned about the, our heart being changed. And so God says, you like the big stuff. What's the big stuff? We like our titles. Do you know a number of Christians that have been messed up by their titles? Because once God gives you a title, you forget to continue walking toward Him or getting closer with Him or being sanctified. Come on, all you do is live off that title. You come to church, you got a title section, you, you write your, when you write your name, you put your title down, you want everybody to know, I must be somebody because um, I use my title. What am I talking about? You walk around saying, I am, uh, oh yes sir, uh, I'm Deacon uh, Do-Right. Mm -hmm. And this is my wife, Mrs. Uh, Deacon Do Right. And just so you know, uh, because we are the Do Rights, we want you to know that's what we do. We do right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You walk around living off that title and you're not living right. Or you walk around as a pastor saying, I'm pastor, you know, uh, smarter than you, have more revelations than you, and this is First Lady smarter than you. And because of first lady smarter than you, then we want you to know what we do is just walk around being smarter than you. But we don't get any closer to God. God is saying the problem is you like the big things, but you don't do the little things that keeps you on track so you don't fall into being a shallow Christian. Here's what you do. You like the big things of, I pray, uh, you know, on Monday, and then I may pray again Thursday. You like running around reading your Bible twice a week. Wednesday, maybe, if you come to Bible study, and Sunday, but I don't read any other time. Uh, you walk around uh, praising God when you hear some music. What I'm saying is, then you got a nerve to expect God to give you big blessings. You want big healings, heal my kids, heal my wife, heal everybody. But God said, I haven't even heard from you. You want big deliverance when your mind is going off and you're depressed. You want God to come around and bring you joy and peace and deliverance. God said, you, you, you haven't prayed since last week. You won't do the... Little things, you don't help folk, you don't thank him regularly. You just walk around trying to get a hold of the big stuff in life. Here is the problem with God. God is saying real deliverance comes from daily walking with him, comes from daily prayer, comes from getting on your knees every night and thanking him, comes from praising him when nobody else is around. As a matter of fact, you can't praise God for what I've been through. God said what you need to understand, it's those little things when you press your way to give you a tithe because you know that I'm a God who will give back, press down. I know some of y'all going to turn me off, don't you dare. God said it's that little thing. You want some big stuff to happen, you won't even stay consistent in your reading of the Word of God. You only read when you got a situation that you need to get out of. God said, no, this Thessalonian church is going to show you that there are the little things that bring you power when you're going through. Do you realize that these, uh, Paul was only there three and a half weeks, and yet I usually give my support scriptures. They're right there in this text now, so go with me. We can go and see what brought this church where they are. The fifth 
chapter, the fifth verse of the first chapter gives us our first clue at what these Thessalonians did. And the Bible says that they sold out and trusted God. Once they heard the gospel, they were sold out. As a matter of fact, 1 Thessalonians tells us that the first thing they did was sold out in verse 5, for our gospel came not unto you with word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as you know what manner we were. When they heard the word preached, and they were excited about it. They stood on it. Come on, be honest with me. When we first got saved, come on, we heard the word. We were believing whatever God said happened. We were believing it was happening. Every day we couldn't wait to grab a Bible. We couldn't wait to read a scripture. We couldn't wait to say thank you. Well, what happened is over time, as things started happening to us, we lost some of our excitement, but not this Thessalonian church. The Bible says they knew the power that saved them is the same power that could keep them, and they honored that power. The Bible tells us, Paul said, they didn't just believe in the word, they saw the power. You saw it too. Come on, it was the power that shook you from the chains that were binding you. It was God's power that delivered you. Don't look there whining now. Think back to those days when God sent down an anointing that shook the house, shook your world, shook the devil, broke your chain, got you up, healed you, delivered you, blessed you. You better realize you've got to remember that when you're going through. This Thessalonians said it's not just word, it's power. And when you don't remember it, you find yourself in a Christian walk that you don't even like yourself. What are you talking about, Reverend? Luke's Gospel, chapter 13, verses 10 through 16, gives a story that I always love because we like to try to understand satanic bondage and spiritual warfare. Well, that's that favorite scripture. Everybody likes it. Woman, thou art loose. But let's look at the story real quick. Jesus saw this woman. Walking up, she was bowed down, had an infirmity in her back, couldn't stand up straight, couldn't see. But here's the part I need you to look in the text and get into. He said, he called her over and said, woman, thou art loose. No provocation. She didn't call him. He looked at her and said, woman, thou art loose. And then the scribes and Pharisees said, uh, uh, why are you healing on the Sabbath day? Jesus said in verse 16 of Luke 13, he said, Should not, ought not, this woman who is a daughter of Abraham, who has been bound down and bound by Satan these 18 years, shouldn't she be set free? I love it. Jesus said, Shouldn't this woman who is the daughter of Abraham. That's what tripped me up because he looked at her and Jesus can see her heart. She was a good Christian woman, but she was bound. Somebody said, the devil can't, can't take over us. The devil can't possess us. Nobody can bound you. And the Bible gives us a clue. When he loosed her, the Bible says she looked up and glorified God. That's the clue. Here's what happened. You can be living a bad life all because you're not excited anymore and won't give God glory for everything he does every day. Do you know what I'm talking about? Little things. Get out of bed and thank God. Look into your cover and thank God. Eat a meal and know that God sustains you. Look at your children and thank God. Pay a bill and give glory to God. He said, said, the reason I'm making it through my persecution is because I give all glory and honor to God. And I let somebody know it is God who brought me here. And so you could be, and the Bible said when Jesus set the woman free, Nothing in the Bible tells us she went back to being in bondage. Because once you're free and you accept it and glorify God, you go to another level. The second thing these Thessalonians did was verse 9. It says they turn to God from idols. 
So the second point is they actually got rid of everything that would distract them and become an idol in their life. Can I move quickly? Some of us don't realize that we have made some stuff in our life. We're saved, but we made things in our life idols. And a matter of fact, the only thing an idol is is something that gets your eye and your mind off God, and that becomes your God because you want it so bad. There's idols of power. Idols of people. We're running around wanting a relationship and wanting to be with people. So much so we forget that if we seek God first, everything else will come into our life. And we walk around and make an idol out of getting married. And an idol, we, look, we get divorced because we make an idol out. I just need to be free. We go around and make idols out of pleasure, idols out of anything. And it takes our mind off the power. So you know what we don't do? We don't do the little things. I'm so caught up and get me a new house and get me a new car and get me some stuff that right now I forgot all about God. Matter of fact, I'm going to use God just to get what I want. Point in question, Samson. Samson found himself empowered by God, but really living weakly because Samson made an idol out of his flesh. You know the bad thing about that? There were times when God's power was so powerful in Samson's life, and yet he made an idol out of that. And not only that, Samson ended up being in bondage when he could have been free and died with his enemies, when he could have been raised up over his enemies. And the last thing these Thessalonians did was verse 10. I love it. They lived every day as if Jesus was going to return. I just said something. You know what will make you do the, do the little things? is when you realize that you live a life as if you're not supposed to be in bondage. You're not supposed to be down. But I live as if God can come any minute. So I live a life of obedience. And can I tell you, you go to Hebrews chapter 11, you'll find out everybody in the hall of faith. Hebrews chapter 11, go to verse 13, you'll find out that everybody in the hall of faith, uh, Abraham, uh, Noah, when you look at those, uh, Enoch walked with God, all of them, the Bible said, and all these died in faith. Verse 13, had not received the promises, but they embraced them from afar off. They proclaimed that they were just pilgrims here. They were looking for another city. What am I telling you? you got to get to the point to know. No, this is not my home. So let's finish this up. So these Thessalonians found out that they were victorious. When Paul found out they were victorious, he gave them in chapter 5 15 admonitions, 15 exhortations. And you go chapter 5 with me. The first 1 through 11, verses 1 through 11, are a follow up to what happened in chapter 4 about the day of the Lord. But then verse 12 down to 23 gives us 15 things we need to do that will motivate us, 15 little things that will give us victory. Now, I know and you know, I don't have time to do 15. So what I did, I broke them down and grouped them into three areas. Write this down and we'll get out of here. The first one is you got to remember to do the love things. Verses 12 to 15, the love things. you got to remember to do the praise things. 16 through 18, the praise things. And then 19 through 23, you got to remember to do the strengthening things. Oh, this is good. Don't, don't miss this. Don't miss it. you got to remember to do the love things. Verse 12 tells us, verse 12 to 15 gives us seven little things we ought to do. The little things that will keep us blessed. Now, you have time to go there. I don't because i got to get out of here. But I want you to see this. And he says, first of all, take care of those who have the rule over you. Then he said, love everybody around you. And then he said, exhort the brethren, uh, warn them who are unruly, support the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men, don't render evil for evil. All of this is talking about walking in God's unconditional love. I found out over these years the strongest part of my leadership. Being a good leader is not when you exert power over everybody. It's not being smarter than everybody. It's making sure you love everybody or they see that you're trying to do something for their good. God first off said the love things are you got to make sure you don't deal in bitterness. Check yourself. Unforgiveness. Check yourself. Envy. Check yourself. Jealousy. If you allow any of those spirits to walk around in you, no wonder you won't do the little thing. Let's look at what God said. If we can remember one factor, love. 
Love is the greatest and most powerful weapon God gave us. You realize that if you can walk in agape love, you leave earth and you go to a new plane because inherently we're not born to love like that. We're born to be selfish. But the Bible tells us that when we got born again, Romans chapter 5 says that when you were born again, the love of God was shed in your heart by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gave us a weapon called love that connects us with God because one of the verses that we know is the foundation of the gospel is the gospel in a nutshell is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Any whosoever cometh to him and believes in him uh, shall not perish and have eternal life. Listen to that text. That's the gospel. Man, that's the whole Bible. I just gave you all 66 books in one verse because it's telling us God loved the start of our power. Then he gave, he sacrificed his only begotten son. Then he allowed anybody to come. That's you and me. And then he said, when you come, you'll never perish. You'll have eternal life with him. He said, I'm going to set you up for life. That life means that God sacrifice because love changes things. Love changes things. Love changes atmosphere. Love changes how we walk. Love gives us a power. Many of us don't understand how 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 deep it is when it say you gave your only son. I always say how many of y'all will give up one of your children? God gave his only son. Let me tell you this quick story. I, I normally share this with folk when they need to see the reality of God's love and that is um, there was this preacher who was preaching one day, and he brought in his mentor, and he had his mentor preach that Sunday morning. So his mentor got in, and, and he was sitting, you know, and when he stepped up to the pulpit after a great introduction, he didn't say anything. He went right into the text. He went right into a story. He said, there was this father, a son, and the son's friend. They started, they went for a sale on the Pacific Ocean. They were going sailing on the Pacific Ocean. The father was a good boatsman. He took his son and his son's friend out. When they got deep into the ocean, a swell came up. A squall came up, excuse me, and all of a sudden a storm hit and the waters were rising so high that the father could not control the boat. As a matter of fact, it was imminent that the boat was going to sink. And sure enough, a wave hit and all three of them was dumped into the ocean, but the father had enough wherewithal to grab the ship, and he grabbed the rope that he had in the ship, and when he looked around this lifeline, he threw it, he, he was standing with the lifeline as he grabbed it, he looked, and he had a decision to make. There was his son, and there was his son's friend. Here's a puzzling thing, he didn't know who to throw it to. That's right. I said there was his son, and his son's friend, he didn't know who to throw it to. And then, it says that he looked, and he remembered one thing, his son was saved. So if his son died, he was going to glory. But his son's friend was not. His father was sitting there reminiscing over what I could do. He believed in the word of God. He looked out at his son and said, oh, Son, I love you. And threw the rope to his son's friend. And then as he pulled the son's friend in, he looked and he saw his son sink in his hand, drop underneath the water. And then he said, finished the text, and then he sat down. Well, at the end of church, these young teenagers were sitting there, and they couldn't wait to walk up to him. They walked up to this preacher and said, that's not, I mean, that, that's unbelievable. That's not a true story. Why would somebody kill their son and, 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 and save their son's friend? And the preacher, packing up things, looked around and said, well, you're right, that is an unbelievable story. Um, and, you know, he grabbed his old warm Bible. And the teenager said, so just so he thought that other man might be a Christian, he let his son die? And he said, well, yeah, it's kind of unbelievable. He said, but I need you to know something. I am that son's friend. I'm not only just a Christian, I'm a preacher because that father showed me the love of God. See, that father let his son die to save one person. Jesus died to save all of us. And it's love. you got to understand the power of love when God said he loves us. You need to know that none of us would have been doing that. The kind of love I'm talking about is adopted love, not any old kind of love. I'm talking about the, the kind of love that says, uh, 
You're at the end of your rope, but I still want you. I know somebody out there besides me is familiar with that kind of love. That's the kind of love where some of us were when God found us. Amen, somebody? God found me at the end of my rope. How many know I wouldn't have gone on? How many can say I never would have made it without God? But the prodigal son tells us and shows us how that father, and he left the house, told the father off, but that father couldn't wait to run to him. Can I tell you something? God is wet. His love makes him run to you every time something goes wrong in your life. Not any old kind of love. That's the woman at the well. It's the you can live again kind of love. This woman at the well with the five husbands and the friends talking about her and the people ostracizing her. But then Jesus said, I must go by and talk to her. Just like he did some of us. How many of us know what he said to this woman at the well is, your life ain't over. You tried six times without me, but come take a drink. Of this everlasting water. Not any old kind of love. Kind of love that says you can live again. And not only not any old kind of love, but the love that says you haven't done too much. Come on now. There's many of us in here that know that if God was counting sin, okay, I know you look all Holy Ghost lovely now, like you're all assured, you know, you, man, come on, there's some stuff in our lives that we're glad that God knows and nobody else knows, but he wanted us anyhow. Love casts out fear. First uh, John 4.18, there is no fear in love. Love is our power because it casts out fear. Love is our assurance because Romans 8 tells us we're more than conquerors because nothing can separate us from his Love, love is our assurance. Love casts out fear. Let me tell you about fear. I, I got this route that I usually walk or run, uh, you know, all the time. And there's this big dog I done told you about before that's on the route. And every time I would pass that dog, I was skipping up, you know. And I, I was brave and everything. But, you know, I had my little stick in my hand. I was ready, but I was scared. And I'd get past there quick until me and my wife like to walk that same route. And I noticed one day when I walked with my wife, I go on the side where the dog is, and I'm, I even got a little pimp going on. I walk, and I'm looking like I got somebody I love right there. I look at that dog. I wish that dog would come out now. What? I wish you would. What happened? Love gives you power. It casts out fear. When you know God loves you, you get blessed. Love is our assurance. Love is our power. Love casts out fear. Now the praise thing. Look at the next three verses. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. And everything you think. Three things that are indispensable if you're going to do little things. You better learn how to be a praiser. You better learn to make some noise. You better learn to shout and thank God just because. How many of y'all know if I had a multitude of tongues, I couldn't thank him enough? But here's what he's saying, that these praise things, praise is our power. Praise is the difference. Praise will set us up because praise is something that God desires. Isn't that something? Nothing we can give God, but the praise we give God, God desires it because it really blesses us. How many of y'all have been in a dark place? And you know you can put on the garment of praise, and it takes off the spirit of heaviness. How many know you can start singing a song and praising? And here is why. The first thing we know about praise is praise is inherent within us. We were born to praise. That's what you were born to praise. Look, in, in, in my house, I don't know what you do in your house, but in our house, when we get together, our big family get together, one of the things we like to do, the Duncan families are singers. Everybody likes to come together, and everybody likes to sing. So what we do is the kids will come up, and they'll all want to sing. Maybe you got a skyline over there that doesn't want to sing. And when those kids or those grandkids get up there, everybody's quiet. Everybody's looking, and they start singing their song. And when they get to the end of that song, you got it. You know what we do? Yay! Oh, that was good. And, and the kids start smiling in there. They're just overjoyed. And everybody in the house is laughing and praying. People coming from other rooms when they hear the praise. What's going on? Because praise can ship an atmosphere. Praise can make something happen. The Bible says that a merry heart do it good like medicine. Praise can lift up a room. As a matter of fact, after that, the sky kid wants to sing because they want some praise also. <laughs> because praise is who we are. Proverbs 27. I want you to see this verse. I want you to write it down. Proverbs 21 and 27 said these words. Said these words. 27 and 21, I'm sorry, says these words. 
The furnace, silver, excuse me, the crucible is the silver. The crucible makes silver. It says the furnace, Proverbs 27, 21, makes gold. But look at the last part of that verse. It says, but a man is tested or made by praise. Do you know that determines the strength of our Christian walk? Somebody said, I didn't find out. Let me give you another again. Proverbs 27, 21. It is a blessing. And we know praise brings God on the scene. Uh, Psalms 100. Uh, many times in church, we all would stand up, and this will be the standard quote, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And if you skip down, enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Or Psalm 22 tells us that God inhabits the praises of his people. Praise brings God on the scene. And if you praise him enough, you'll do the little things that will give you big results. Praise gives big results. And then it says, pray without ceasing. All that means is I establish this repertoire of praise. has nothing to do with trying to be professional. It just means I talk to my God every day. And then I, I love the verse that tells us, if we praise and pray and in everything give thanks, we will be blessed. Why? Because praise defeats the enemy. Praise will defeat our enemies. Praise will, uh, you know, I, I believe that when Joshua, and I'm going to my last point, Joshua was marching around the walls of Jericho. Think about it. God knew, he told him, God gave him his plan. Uh, march one day, one time around for six days. Seven days, seven times. And Joshua and them were building up this trust and this love and this faith for God. You know, that's what happens when you're on a mission, you're doing what God says. Nobody knows unless you've been there. You know, when you're doing something, it makes no sense, but you know God said do it. And I believe that God was up in heaven, and man, when that seventh time came, on the seventh day, when the seventh, and all of a sudden he they shouted, that praise was built up so deep. I believe God was so glorified with everyone thinking and praising God. Our God is good. God is great. Blessed be the name of God. Said the walls fell down because of the praise. Praise has power to defeat your enemy. You got to do the love things. You got to do the praise things. And finally, look at the end of this text. It says you have to do the Strengthening things. I, I, I can close this up. I know this part because I, I get blessed by these verses. Don't quench the spirit. The spy is not prophesying. The spy is not prophesying. Don't quench the spirit. And in, and in everything give thanks. I'm sorry, that's where it goes. In everything give thanks. And then it says, may the uh, God sanctify you, spirit, soul, and body, holy. Here's what God is saying. As we close today, here, here are going to strengthen things. Don't quench the spirit. Don't let your fire go out. I don't care what anybody does. Don't let your fire go out. Despise not prophesying. We can get our organists in here now because we get ready to close. Despise not prophesying. Listen to God's directions. First of all, let me go back to the question. I, don't let your fire go out. And don't let anybody you hang around let your fire go out. If you stay excited, you'll keep doing little things. The spies not prophesying. Listen for the voice of God. Say, speak to my heart, Lord Jesus. And God will speak to your heart. Prove all things. Know that it's the voice of God. Get strong enough with God that you prove it and test it. Don't just listen to anything. Prove it and test it. And then finally, abstain from all appearances of evil. God is saying, this will leave power when you start thinking... How will my God feel if I did that? I'm not doing it because it won't bring God glory. Little things, big results. Ask the people at Thessalonica. They lived through the persecution because of the little things. There was this gorilla that lived in a 12 by 12 cell. And the gorilla could walk around that cell blindfolded. He knew that boundaries left and right. He could go left. When he got to the end of the wall, he turned back around. This gorilla could go back and forth. Well, his owners, as he got bigger, decided to make him a 36-foot cell. But the gorilla would still walk only 12 feet. Turn around and walk 12 feet. All the rest of the cell was never used. That's where we are. 
some of us have gotten so used to our little routine of doing big things. I want big anointing, big stuff. That you need to get into a routine of little things so you can expand your anointing. God bless you. Have a great day. Tell somebody, I got to get back to the routine of doing little things so I can get some big results. If you enjoyed that word, give God a hand to praise right where you are. If you're not saved today, repeat these words. Lord God, I need you to come into my heart. I believe you're the Savior. I confess it now, and I am saved. If you pray that prayer and you believe it, give us a call. Go to our website, leave a note, and we'll get back to you. This is Pastor Doka saying have a blessed night, a blessed day, a peaceful night, and go on trusting and believing God. Little things bring us big results. Take it to him and leave it there. I was down, but with a no way up, and I needed some help. Everybody breathing, but not living, just existing. Well, and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free. I tried it for myself and now I know what he did.